Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olena. I am a developer advocate at Ivan, where we help engineers to deal with complexities and challenges of database infrastructure. And we also support and contribute a lot into open source projects. And today I wanted to talk to you about two amazing open source technologies ruling the world of data, Apache Kafka and ClickHouse. Uh, both of them are highly scalable distributed solutions and both allow us to work with big amounts of data but quite in different ways. So instead of competing, these technologies actually complement each other. And maybe by the end of this talk, you will decide to add them to your toolbox when working with data. Um, could you raise your hand if you worked with Apache Kafka in the past? Wow, we have almost everyone. And could you raise your hand if you worked with ClickHouse in the past? Uh, no one. Uh, that's actually good, because then my introduction might be quite helpful. So our roadmap for our journey for today looks like this. We will start with a short uh, discussion of what is the challenge of storing big amounts of data long term. Then we will move and see, and see how Apache Kafka and ClickHouse fit into the solution. Uh, I will stop a bit longer on the ClickHouse and how it differs from other solutions you might know already. Then we will move to the demo. I prepared a GitHub repository, so if you're really good at multitasking, you can even follow me along. Then we will talk about things you need to be aware of when working with uh, ClickHouse. And finally, I will leave you some additional materials which will help you to dive deeper into this topics. So data is everywhere. And the more data we can handle, the bigger value it can bring, the better business decisions we can make. In the past, uh, when dealing with data, we processed what we needed, selected bits and pieces, stored it in the database and threw away the rest because storing raw data felt unfeasible not only because of storage volumes, but also because of our limited processing powers. Luckily, this is all changing, and now we are relying quite a lot on event-driven architecture. Uh, and we look at the data through the prism of continuously coming events. And the streams of data help us uh, to process real-time information and make fast decisions. However, what to do with this data in a month? in a year, in a decade? How can we keep this data long term and then use it for some analytics later? We know that Apache Kafka and other event messages, messaging platforms offer great uh, permanent storage. However, when we talk about petabytes of data and when we expect reasonably fast response, we need a solution of a different type. So we need to have, we need to move our data back to some kind of long-term storage. And obviously the transactional databases, they are quite ineffective to slow for these magnitudes of data. So we need something bigger like a data warehouse or a data lake. When we are talking about data warehouses, we usually assume that we have good clarity on the data structure which we have. However, often when we work with data, we need to start with the raw unfiltered data coming from our multiple systems. So our solution should not only work with the raw data as it is, or like should keep big magnitudes of raw data, it should also offer us tools which will help us shape this data uh, when it is needed and also in then perform of efficient analytical requests. And this is where Apache Kafka and ClickHouse uh, can be a convenient choice. If you are not familiar with, uh, with these technologies, Apache Kafka is a distributed event streaming platform that helps uh, handling transportation of messages between multiple systems and ClickHouse is a database management system designed specifically for online analytical processing to store huge mag uh, magnitudes of data and also to uh, then perform fast queries. 
Uh, Apache Kafka can be an obvious choice for many in this room, but what is so special about ClickHouse? Uh, both of them, Apache Kafka and ClickHouse, are distributed and they scale very well. ClickHouse can be used across hundreds of nodes and, for example, Cloudflare uses ClickHouse on over 100 nodes. Secondly, ClickHouse is exceptionally fast at processing analytical requests. And in the notes, I will leave the uh, links to the benchmarks to compare to other solutions. Uh, and very importantly for our converse conversation today, uh, there is already integration between ClickHouse and Apache Kafka. And in fact, ClickHouse is often used in combination with Apache Kafka. Apart from this, ClickHouse is in many ways unusual. It literally turns around many of the concepts that we are familiar with. And if you look at the list of the prominent features of the ClickHouse from its documentation, you can see that almost all of them are somehow focusing on the performance of the system and efficiency. So uh, just to understand a bit better what stands behind ClickHouse, let's look very briefly at a couple of the most prominent features of it. So it is a column-oriented database management system, which is quite different from the row-oriented approach, which we are used to in PostgreSQL, MySQL, and many other amazing databases we are working with, where the data is stored row by row. In ClickHouse, the data is stored column by column. That means that each column belongs to a separate file and we can include or exclude those columns when we perform uh, the requests. Um, and also ClickHouse describes itself as a truly columnar database because not only it stores the data from the same column, the values next to each other physically on the disk, it also keeps those values clean. So there is no extra data attached to those values, which means that we can very easily compress, I mean, maybe not easily, but efficiently compress that data uh, targeting the specific type of data. To navigate the columns, uh, ClickHouse uses indexes, and there are two types of indexes available. First one is the primary index, uh, but it's quite different from other primary indexes we are using in other solutions because it doesn't index every row. It indexes every 8192nd row, which actually means a bit more sense if we look at the binary of that value, uh, and it is called the sparse index. The secondary index also is a bit unusual because actually it describes which data will be safe to skip when we are performing a computation. And another cool tool ClickHouse uses to be fast are vectorized executions. So the columns, when processing the data, ClickHouse divides the columns into separate chunks and then assigns different cores to works on those chunks of data in parallel. This makes the computations quite efficient. So with this small information about ClickHouse, you're probably wondering how we can work with this. Uh, so let's see it in action. In particular, let's connect uh, Apache Kafka. Uh, let's connect Apache Kafka and ClickHouse, bring the data from Apache Kafka topic into ClickHouse, shape the data and send the requests. But first, let me tell you a bit about the scenario we will be using today. So this is my first time in England and it is such iconic location for those of us who enjoyed reading Harry Potter. So I couldn't resist using uh, Hogwarts and its educational system for our story today. So for those of you who didn't read Harry Potter, no worries, no essential knowledge here. For those of you who did, you probably thought that the educational system of Hogwarts is built on magic. But I must assure you that it actually relies a lot on Apache Kafka and ClickHouse, at least in my interpretation. So uh, in Hogwarts, we have students and students attend multiple classes. Every time a student enters a classroom, an event is sent into Apache Kafka 
topic. So over time we have millions of those events growing through the topic and we want to bring the data into ClickHouse for future storage and analysis. In the README, uh, you will see the more detailed steps of how to follow this example, as well as information how to set up the systems we need. And also two files, each of which between two and three million of messages. And each message contains information about the student, about which room student enters, the timestamp and other details. Uh, I will be using one file, just putting it into topic in Apache Kafka so that we have a bulk of data there. And the second file I will be using to send message by message so that we have a continuous feeling of flow of the data. Five million messages is admittedly a small quantity for ClickHouse. But I felt this example is easy to follow and play with. I will leave links to bigger data sets which you can use, especially if you plan to run some benchmarks. There are plenty of cool data sets uh, existing. Uh, for the sake of today's experiment, I'm running both Apache Kafka and ClickHouse locally in my machine. I have Zookeeper running and uh is it moving yeah i have zookeeper running i have apache kafka okay i it doesn't move on my screen uh, so i'm creating a topic and i'm sending data with a keycat for the year uh, 2002 2012 um, and i'm also using a script to send the data from the second file row by row and uh, meanwhile, we can connect to ClickHouse server uh, to yes to ClickHouse servers through the ClickHouse client. I'm relying on Docker here, uh, and I got the latest images from Docker Hub. The image for the client is a bit older than the server. Um, that's why we see that message informing us about that. But it should be fine. So now we have. Apache Kafka topic with the data flowing there. So let's connect and bring that into ClickHouse. And before we do this, let's look at the building blocks which we will need. So we have Apache Kafka topic on one side, ClickHouse, uh, ClickHouse on another. And I mentioned there is already integration between those systems. So we have Kafka engine. This is how the ClickHouse called it. Uh, Kafka engine plays the role of a consumer and it will pull the data from the topic, bring it through the materialized view into the destination table. And each of these building blocks we can define with the help of SQL query. So uh, the Kafka engine is a table itself uh, and in the settings we can define the brokers, the topic list, the consumer group name and the format of the data. I am using here JSON as string. It's not the only uh, possible solution, uh, but it means actually that I am expecting the whole uh, message as a single string uh, from the topic. And then we define the destination table, uh, which is uh, uh, in this example relies on the merge tree. Merge tree is the most popular engine in ClickHouse. Uh, it has a lot of functionality built on top of it. We define the columns uh, in this uh, table and we will order the data by the timestamp. And finally, we have materialized view, which will be like a bridge between Kafka engine table and destination table. Uh, which will look like this. And we will also define how exactly we will convert the data. So let's add these three blocks into our system. I'm just bringing those. Okay, I don't see it. Um, and when everything is good, then ClickHouse client just outputs the query, says what is the query ID, and that's it. If not, it would have shown us some errors. 
So now that we have three building blocks inside the system, we should expect that the data will start, start flowing. Um, and Kafka engine will bring the data actually in bulks, the size of which we can define, because in this way, it's way easier to merge data then together than using line by line. It's more efficient. Um, so we can also count the number of items which are already in the destination table. If you can see that it started with zero, then one million, then two millions, and we can run other queries. For example, this one will calculate how many points all the students received over the years grouped by the house of Hogwarts. So we brought the data from Apache Kafka topic through Kafka engine with the help of materialized view into class attendance table. Now we can continue and build the next step of our data pipeline to demonstrate how we can transform the data and use it as an input for the new tables. And in particular, we will uh, transform and aggregate the data for the analytics for the classes, individual classes, which happen in Hogwarts and calculate how many students were present at every class. And we will use again the materialized view. And by creating a materialized view, we actually add a trigger, a trigger which will observe the source table. In our case right now, this is class attendance table. And when new data is added into the source table, it will be used as an input for transformation through materialized view and adding into destination table uh, student presence. And our queries, like if we count the number of students, will look like this. And this will work fine. However, if we run those queries, we will notice that only new items are being added because, of course, this is how a trigger works. It's a bit more visible if we look at the timeline. So we have continuously flowing data into the source table. So on the Wait, left, right. On the left, we have the data which uh, was already added into the system and on the right, all the infinity of the future values which we expect. And in the middle, this is where we are. So we add value by value. So we are moving. If we add a materialized view, it will start processing the data, uh, the new data. The old data is not responsibility of the materialized view. Of course, we can use the insert statement to copy the data, to process the data and move it into the new table. But because we are constantly moving, we need also some kind of a strategy so that we neither copy values twice nor we accidentally skip some values. There are different approaches for this uh, and probably it's a classical problem. So for this, I decided to select just a close uh, just a point in time in close future. Then we create a materialized view and we instruct materialized view to start processing data from that point of time onwards. And meanwhile, we are waiting till we cross that point of time and use the insert statement to bring the old data into the destination table. Long story short, let me show you this in action. So we are uh, creating a destination table and now we are uh, looking for the current timestamp in the source table. So where we are right now. And this is 11th of January and I'm selecting a timestamp a bit farther in the future. I'm selecting 13th of January and creating a materialized view saying counted from the 13th of January only. And I made a typo. There was a space. ClickAll said that my date looks rubbish. So uh, fixing that. Uh, and now we have materialized view in the system. And of course, we need to wait till 13th of January when it will start working. Uh, our data is flowing pretty fast. So uh, the days pass by <laughs> very fast. Um, and now 13th of January is here. And if we count the items, the number of items um, in the new table, we can see that the data started flowing, the fresh data, uh, which goes through materialized view. So now we can insert all the old data uh, into the system. 
into the stable or process and insert uh, by using an insert query. So we do that. And now if you run the count, uh, we will see way bigger number of the items. We see almost 200,000 and the data will be coming. So we processed all data. We have also fresh data coming. Um, we can run some other requests here. Uh, so we, uh, I will bring in here also count, but we can run other requests to calculate the minimum, maximum or average number of students uh, per class. Uh, so this is how materialized views work. What else we can do? Um, we can use aggregate functions. Aggregate functions allow us to pre-process some of the values and store it in the table. In this way, when we send the request, the whole um, processing takes way less time. And here we rely on the uh, different uh, functions to uh, achieve this. And if you actually will read the table with uh, the student aggregate daily where we use aggregate function, you will see that the data doesn't really make any sense because it's an intermediate result. It's, a, uh, it's something which in the between and then when we perform the queries with a select and using the max uh, merge and min merge and other merge functions, uh, they are uh, significantly faster. What else we have in the ClickHouse? Uh, we have arrays and arrays are first class citizens. Uh, so you create, create lambdas, funnels, there are a lot of um, built in functions for working with arrays. TTLs for columns and for tables. Uh, we can also run approximate calculations um, based on sample of the data. There are different engines which are spe specified for like particular scenarios um, and uh, targeting some different use cases. And this is only a small fraction of the features which we have in ClickHouse, but we need to move on and talk a bit about the potential challenges uh, when working with ClickHouse. Click, ClickHouse is designed to be fast, but it's quite important to avoid data swamp. Uh, and when working with data lake, we accept that the structure of data is not ideal, but it must be controllable. The better the structure is, the faster will be the request time. And we should aim at transforming uh, the data and improving its structure. And we can use uh, different approaches. Uh, we can use materialized views, as we have seen. Uh, we can use arrays, especially when we have JSON objects, we can transform the data into array and use a key value there. If it's still uh, pretty slow, then we can materialize some of those into columns. In general, ClickHouse prefers to work with big, uh, like with, with, uh, to have uh, tables with lots of columns in it where the values are um, small. So, um, uh, of course, when we send the request, we need only to request information from certain columns and not really do it across all the table. Um, but with the manageable information in every column, we can assign proper types, use proper compression, which will speed up the uh, request execution. And all in all, our goal is to keep the data maximally denormalized and prepared for query and analysis. And I think we still have time to leave some time for the questions. Um, this is the additional materials uh, which I prepared again in the GitHub repository. Um, there is a list of the things which I mentioned, including how to work with materialized views, how to work with Kafka engine, uh, the data sets and uh, the benchmarks. Um, I hope that those can help navigate the first steps working with ClickHouse. And lastly, um, if you're planning to use ClickHouse, especially if you plan to use it in combination with Apache Kafka or PostgreSQL, uh, check out Ivan.io. This is actually a company where I work to be transparent uh, because we recently released uh, Ivan for ClickHouse beta 
and uh, our engineering team is working on uh, the integration parts of uh, ClickHouse. Uh, so check it out and let me know uh, how it goes. We are always looking for the feedback. And that's it from my side. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And I'm all ears to your questions because I think, yeah. files with uh, presto or dream or speed and stuff like that because today what we use this is, I, I'm, I'm trying to think if we can use it in the place today we use uh, orc files with trino that query mm -hmm. so it takes a lot, a lot a lot of time but but it works you know it's, it's, it's our formation is that to be a, a good place for I think so. I am not completely sure. Like I think it will depends in which state your data is. So where I'm talking about the data structure is very important. Uh, like ClickHouse, um, I didn't. I don't know about particular technologies which you are describing, but um, ClickHouse can be really, really fast, and benchmarks really showing that. Uh, but the data should be uh, prepared for that. So we, we need to have a pretty clear data and uh, to use all the features of uh, ClickHouse for that. And then it can perform like uh, quite fast comparing to all the uh, solutions and taking into account this is an open source solution. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it performs on its level uh, pretty impressively. So that's what I can say, but I don't know those particular cases which you mentioned. I can also maybe connect you to uh, the solution architects uh, who are working right now with the ClickHouse. And then uh, if you just come and talk and uh, like to answer those questions which you have. Yes. How can it use it? It, it, it sounds like it's all consistent, right? It's managing the metadata and having some storage. It's not like it's the storage is open to other tools, but like such as Spot C squared, right? Uh, so, but if you move the data into data lake for long term, for example, we don't have to touch it for some time, but we also can run queries and then we can create a data pipelines and just move and create new tables within the data lake, which will be, uh, which will be more structured and more prepared for the requests. I think what it means is that the data is closed inside the system. I mean, unlike we, unlike for instance, parquet files or any other code or file, which you can query with other tools as well, ClickHouse says the data lake is, is closed. You can't query with other tools if the, the under these files. You can, so when you send the query from outside, the analytical queries, you send it from outside. No, you... via ClickHouse. Yes. Only via ClickHouse. I can't use yes. Uh, I think, I, I don't know, yeah. So of course you can use, because also like when talking about Apache Kafka and ClickHouse, so you can bring the data with Apache Kafka into ClickHouse and you can bring the data from ClickHouse also using a Kafka engine. So it works both ways. So if you need then later to bring the data in some way transformed into Postgre uh, PostgreSQL, uh, you can use a Cli uh, Apache Kafka. And I mentioned that it's often used in combination, these two technologies, exactly for the reason because we need to plug other systems. And because of the connectors which Apache Kafka offers, uh, this is such a popular combination. Yeah, I also, I, I'm sorry, I might not really understand exactly the scenario. And if I save uh, my data in one, in, in my own, so it's in a data lake, I can query it with various tools. I can query it with Spark, with Trino, depending on uh, the mm. use case and the SLA that I need to support. Um, but if I, if I uh, uh, use Kafka to uh, put the data into two separate places, 
No, of course it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you, you're right. So like I was meaning that if you need the data from the click house to be used later somewhere in another system, you can bring it. But of course, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how I, like um, click house with Spark, how they work between each other. I don't know. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes. This is a very good question because with uh, Kafka, we usually use like we are using message by message and we consider this the most efficient way. ClickHouse is not designed for that. Um, it's because the way we expect a huge amount of data coming. So we need also to quickly ingest the data. And by using bigger bulks, it's easier for us to merge this data into the table. For example, this merge tree, the type of the table, it will uh, smartly try, the data is physically sorted on the disk. So, but if we start merging line by line, the performance will drop significantly. So uh, what the Kafka engine does, it will actually keep and will try to do it bulk by bulk and uh, like they say i don't remember it's like even like a million of messages merging at a given time is the kind of golden value uh so it should be a big amount of data because we expect like petabytes of data inside uh and we cannot really do row by row the time is up uh if you have any questions or want to talk about these technologies please uh come by i will stay i think there is uh uh, I'm not sure if there is another session after this. Okay,